to do this. Can you do that? Three, two, three. Okay. All right, all right, all right. It says in First Corinthians 15, it says, In Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. It doesn't say some will be made alive. It says all will be made alive. Okay? I, I, I want to digress, but this is really important to me. And I'm Jewish, okay? I'm a, I'm a Jewish believer. I'm better than everyone. I, trust me, there's books written about people like me that say we are the most powerful spiritual beings on the planet. I love that. Someone sent me one of those books. I read one. I was like, this is better than my own press releases. I'm going to believe this. But seriously, I'm a Jewish believer. Every single Christian, traditional Christian, mostly, but you know, every Christian I've ever met who finds out I'm a Jew goes, wow, you, know, you guys are God's chosen people. You guys are God's chosen people. You guys are God's chosen people. They didn't say you were God's chosen people. Does not, does not the Bible say that the Jews are God's chosen people? Did God not say in his own word, he did not choose my people for wrath? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Did they stop being the chosen people when the Christians started taking over America? And, and, and why do we support Israel? You know, we don't care about Israel. We just want the bombing to start because we want Armageddon to start so we can be raptured. So we can get be done with it. So we can be done with it. We don't care about Israel. We don't care about the Jewish people. But my gosh, a Jewish Christian walks into church. I get the best seat in the house. And I get the best parking spaces. And I get invited to the pastor's house for dinner. Because I'm a Jew. <laughs> and then they have stuck with me for two hours. <laughs> nice. Are they not still the, ch the chosen people? And what are they chosen for then? I'm curious. I'm curious. Like, because I, I always thought they were chosen for being the people who represent God to the earth. Did that ever stop? Never stop. I'm sorry. I have, I've read the entire Bible cover to cover, and the very end of the Bible discusses this amazing evangelism that happens with the Jews and <coughs> new Jewish converts go everywhere and preach the gospel in a way no one's ever done before. I'm sorry. I just read a book about people like me that we get saved and we preach the gospel unlike anyone's ever preached it before. Anyone who's ever heard me speak, forgive me. I preach the gospel like nobody. Nobody. You cannot say I'm like somebody. No way. Huh. And I'm going to say this. I have done nothing of my own merit to save myself. And I have done nothing of my own merit to save others. Well, you, you've shared the Lord with millions and you've led thousands of people to, I absolutely, absolutely. I walk into a room and the kingdom goes where I go. And the second you make contact to me, I have led you to the Lord. That is a fact. You know where I read that? Bible. I read that in my Bible. It has nothing to do with how clever I am, because I am clever. I am clever. I, I can turn a phrase, and I can, I can really do the swell during my preaching, and really get in there and sock it to you. You know? I have nothing to do with that. It's the Holy Spirit. He's either here or not. Is he here? Oh, yeah. Even when I sing bullshit. <laughs> it says in Romans that God's gift and calling, gifts and calling, are irrevocable. Okay. If God's gifts and calling are irrevocable, if they're irrevocable, when did some people not get them? When does, when, does, when does the faucet turn off? When does the faucet turn off? So God's gifts of life and my favorite Jesus, salvation and stuff like that. And his calling, my favorite being, come to me, come to me, come to me. 
They don't go away. They're irrevocable. They don't go away. So when did they turn off from people? Like divine. When did God stop calling divine through Jesus? According to your theology. It says, 2 Corinthians, that God delivered us all from so great a death where it says elsewhere in the Bible that we are all God's elect, not some are God's elect. We are all God's elect. But let's go back to divine. Forgive me. This one you will have to explain on the way home. And Pink Flamingos, the, one of the most famous underground art house movies in history at the very end of the movie that already had actual violence, actual sex, including something with a chicken. I still don't know if I could ever explain to someone. <laughs> but if it weren't enough, the film culminated with Divine eating actual dog poop. That's because there's a kid in the room. Dog shit. She's eating. Divine eats dog shit in the movie. And there's books and documentaries on how that really happened and what they fed the dog before and why they did it and blah, blah, blah. It's pretty gross stuff. Wow, Pastor, you just said you really love this movie and you know it by heart. You know what? Anyone who's seen the movie, anybody in the room other than Jeff, has Jeff seen it? Okay. So he will understand that I'll say this. That is a fantastic movie up until the end. It's that last part that you walk away going, they really didn't need to do that because it broke the character of the movie and it, and it doesn't even, it doesn't work the way it sounds like it worked. And prior to that, it's pretty jaw-dropping, horrific stuff, that movie. I didn't need to be more obnoxious. But anyways, made it very, very famous, made Divine very famous. Well, that fat, ugly transvestite who eats dog shit isn't going to be in my heaven, God damn it. I'm sorry. Well, let's be fair. Let's be fair. That's the point. That's the point. Reba McIntyre could make it to heaven because she's a good old girl and she probably thanks the Lord when she gets a Grammy. But we don't know if she's a Christian or not. Sandy Patty is an adulteress, but she had good records, so she's probably making it in. I was at Donna Summer's church, and I was with a group of Christians at a party and listened to a room full of people say, she's probably not even a Christian anymore. What kind of Christian is Donna Summer? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. As an aside, just, I can't tell you how hard it was for that poor woman to become a Christian at the height of her career. I can't tell you how traumatic it was for her and what she went through. But I'll tell you one thing. She was born again. That's a fact. I think our ability to love and to serve and even accept the concepts of heaven and hell are shaped by our self-esteem. I'm sorry, did you say what? You thought I was going to say by our prejudices. I am going to say they're by our pre prejudices, but starting with our own. The way I honestly see myself is the, the end all of how good I can see you. People judge me for being so arrogant and so cavalier and and you know what? Go to a cavalier, arrogant Christian, someone who's confident and excited about who they are in the Lord. They probably have a great sense of self. They have a lot of room in their heavenly kingdom for people. But go to someone who hates themselves and feels sh shitty about themselves and is scared of everybody and everything that's different and they're going to be legalistic and they're going to be judgmental and they're gonna tell you oh no you can't oh no oh no you can't oh no you can't do that no you can't do that no you can't don't say that don't say that don't say that don't even say that 
不用你们谢。God has given me a long leash, a long leash, the longest I've seen from any minister I've ever met. And what has come with it is a tremendous amount of obnoxiousness out of my mouth, <laughs> and an amazing understanding of how patient and loving. Our Father in Heaven is, because if He still likes me at the end of the day, He must really like you too. That's the truth. That's the truth. As I get older and older in the Lord and get away with more and more and more, the more I see over and over and over again in my growth in Christ is that when I first became a Christian 33 years ago, my concept of love was very small. Now that I'm much older, my concept of God's love is massive. Me, not so much. I don't really like anybody that much. But God really loves everybody. Do you care what I think, or do you care about what God thinks? God really loves people. He loves, loves, loves them. He's done everything He can do. Hmm. He's done everything He can do. I mean, like, I don't know where my notes. Oh, there it is. Jesus did everything to reach us. Everything. Jesus did everything to reach us because how much He loves us, right? God's omnipotent. You know what that means? He's a know-it-all. <laughs> so He knew Paul would say yes, right? He knew Paisley would say yes, right? So what if Paul had died the day before the big day? Where would Paul have gone when he died if God knew that tomorrow Paul would have said yes? Ah, oh, shit! We killed him too fast. Now, I'm sorry, Paul, but you're you're going into the lake of fire. I'm sorry. I know we're not supposed to. Process the things of God in our logic, logical mind. But my logical mind says that's bunk. My logical mind says God knows everything that's going to be. You know, I I have witnessed a lot in my life, meaning I've shared the gospel with a lot of people. And you know, people say to me, "I don't want your religion." You know, I don't want my religion either. But it's what I'm stuck with. And it's what you're stuck with. This is what we're stuck with. We're stuck with God is who God is, and Jesus who Jesus is, and that's that. What we're not stuck with is the need to have a debate. You're not going to preach at me. Why would I preach at you? I preach for a living. If you want to hear preaching, come come next Sunday. Why? I don't want to waste my breath. Well, I don't understand. Well, here's what I think. I think God knows everything. God knows whether or not you. If given a fair chance to accept Christ, would or wouldn't? That's what I really believe. I always believe that. So, you know, let's just fast forward to the day you die. That's between you and God. It's always made sense to me. If you don't live with Him in this life, you're not going to spend eternity with Him. However, I don't know if that's really true. What do you mean, Paisley? You're going to uproot all your theology after all these years? Probably not. You know why? That would put a lot of paperwork on my desk that I don't feel like dealing with. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. But you know what I will say? I have never once discredited the fact that God knows you better than I judge you. So you may seem like a stinking, rotten, awful person who could give a flying twinkie and a rolling donut about Jesus, but God knows if Jesus showed up and looked you in the eye, exactly what you would say. And if you really, really are a person that would have Jesus in your face, and you'd still flip the bird, for your sake. I praise God. There's a hell because I guess hell would be spending eternity with that guy anyway. So it's a blessing from God that there's some place else for you to spend eternity. But you know what? I don't care. I don't care. I don't care with 
the majority of the human race. Because what matters more is somebody tells you right now how important you are to God. But that's very hard in this Christian climate. Because in this Christian climate, we have the gospel of us and them. And our hate and our biases and our prejudice and our agenda shape our theology. Let me say this again. It's not how much you love that shapes your theology. It's how much you hate. It's how much you hate. Hate is the product of fear. So how much you fear? You either love or you're afraid. But your theology is anti-gay, not because the Bible is, because if anyone takes five minutes of research to look up exactly what the Greek and Hebrew texts say on the subject, on those scriptures, you don't have an argument anymore. You don't have solid proof one way or the other, but you've lost your argument. You can find that out on Wikipedia, by the way. But if you hate queers because they make you uncomfortable and they make you scared, your theology goes that way. But if you could care less and you're really secure in your masculinity, then you're cool with gays. So God must be because you're cool. I'm cool with gays. God must be. Gays make me uncomfortable. It must make God puke. Our hate, biases, and prejudices and agenda affect our theology, what we believe. I became a Christian, and, and the woman who led me to the Lord found out that I had an ex-girlfriend that had committed suicide, and she told me she was in hell. I was like, what an awful thing to say. And she was never a Catholic, and she said, well, what an awful thing to say. She goes, it's true. And I go, well, it's an awful thing to say. What, what point is it for you to say that to me? And she goes, I was afraid. Of what? I was afraid that if someone didn't tell you, you'd find out later somehow. Well, hello, it's not in the Bible anywhere. I'm not encouraging suicide, but it doesn't determine your eternal resting place. You know what determines your eternal resting place? Jesus. You know who gave you life in the first place? Jesus. You know who, who knew exactly every single thing you were ever going to do in your life? Jesus. Do you know that before Jesus became the Jesus we've heard of, he knew how all this was going to end? Who is the author and perfecter of our faith? Jesus. I'm really sorry, but if before anything ever happened, anything, Jesus knew it, he let it happen. And I'm telling you, in our law, in America, if I let you do something, I'm going to come. I'm an accomplice. So before anything ever happened, Jesus knew it was going to happen, including dun, 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 the fall of Lucifer. I'm sorry. Well, who knew that was going to happen? Who created Lucifer? The same guy who created you. Who knew that the majority of Christians would never, ever research on their own, anything on their own. My gosh, most Christians don't even read their own Bibles. I saw something really shocking and horrific on the internet the other night. I looked up a word on the internet, Gehenna, and I found the Wikipedia page for Gehenna. And it says on the Wikipedia page 
that the King James Bible is the only Bible in history to use the word hell for that place. The only Bible in history. But that's when it started. I said, I saw that with my own eyes, and I said, well, I mean, that's, that's a fine kettle of fish. Look it up. Look it up. Look it up before you show up at a funeral saying fags are going to hell. You can visit hell in Jerusalem right now. It's a resort. There really is a highway to hell in Jerusalem. Look all this stuff up. What I'm saying is, is that there's a little bit more to all of this. There's a little bit more to all of this. And now, with the advent of the internet a.k.a. the Antichrist. If, with the advent of the internet, Christians are without excuse. Billy Graham said that the reason why Jesus came when he came because the road systems had just been developed, that the gospel could really get out to all the world. I'm telling you that now all Christians can come into a whole new level of understanding of who Jesus is, meaning who they are in Christ, if they take time to research and learn. If they take time to research and learn. But I'm going to say, as a prophet of the Most High God, that you can only believe as much as your hate and biases and prejudice and agenda will allow you. You can only believe. You can only learn so much. Now, I'm not going to say the Holy Spirit is a gentleman because that's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Anyone who says Look, God's a gentleman, bullshit. I am sorry. He's intrusive and obnoxious. <laughs> Wakes you up in the middle of the night. Please, please. Anyone who has an on fire relationship with the Lord knows that we gave up sleep a long time ago. Or the guarantee of sleep. Give me a break. Give me a break. No, God is intrusive. God sends floods. Plagues, fire. I mean, come on, Mick. He's a, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to ask you to do anything you don't want to do. Really? That's called hypnosis. Holy Spirit spends your entire life hounding you, challenging you, putting choices in your path, encouraging you, and according to the word of God, moves inside of you and changes you from the inside into a completely different human being. Who you're supposed to be in Christ for all eternity. A gentleman. He comes in and rearranges all the furniture. <laughs> he does things his way. But in the meantime... In the meantime, we have to come up with an immediate solution to a lifelong problem that we will continue to have. We need a band-aid to tide us over until we figure out how to get before the Lord and find out how bad our biases, prejudices, hate, and agenda are. Before we can learn how to do that, we have to know what we're going to do in the meantime till we get that under control. And what I'm talking about is how are we going to treat people? How are we going to treat people? See, I'm always going to go back to evangelism because it's the only thing I care about. And evangelism in the Bible wasn't getting people saved. It was getting Christians revved up and learning how to act right. So the only thing I care about in this life is getting people walking with the Lord and getting Christians to learn how to behave. And you know, I'm not going to tell you not to go see R-rated movies. 
But like my magnet on my fridge says, Jesus is coming, hide the porn. So, <laughs> but what I am going to say is, until you have perfected the art of finding out what a complete moronic ass you are, and how that is affected, how you believe, and how you read and comprehend your Bible, err on the side of caution in dealing with the rest of the human race. Treat every single human being like they're your kid. Yeah, unless you're you. Everyone else, know how you'd want a stranger to treat your kid. Not how you treat your kid, but you know, I can say things to my kids that you people sure as hell can't. 